Um, good evening, everyone. We are pleased to welcome you all for the third edition of uh, the State Talks series, organized by the Faculty of Architecture at SIP. The series invites speakers who are engaged with particular aspects of architectural design and production in their practice to throw light on topics that are central to the profession but are less discussed or theorized with academia. The series is scheduled from, from 15th March to 19th March and the thematic focus for the series this, year's, this year is architectural detailing. Ismit Kambata, our first speaker for today, shall deliver her perspective on reading details, which is also the title for today's talk. She is an architect and an urban designer with over 30 years of professional experience. She is the founder and managing director at TDW and the Bath the head of FACE, that is, Facade Applications for Conservation of Energy, and works in collaboration with HCP, DPM, with her expertise in a wide range of furniture design, manufacturing, and shading devices for building facades. For various typologies, she's invited to deliver for the straight talk. The lecture would be followed by a question and answer round, so please add, in, add your questions in the chat box. Ma'am, you can read Okay, so Sankalpa, should I start? Yes, please, Ismat. Okay. So thank you all very much for inviting me. And um, as you mentioned, I'm going to talk about details. Um, what will be slightly different about this, this presentation is that it is not specifically about architectural details, but it's about detailing in general and um, detailing in what we do, which is uh, mainly uh, we make furniture and we make shading systems. Now, to get started right away, um, all of us, I mean, we, we are constantly looking at things, looking at details. We often think of details as something that happens later on, you know, once, once the concept is in place, the design uh, is uh, together, and then details will happen. That's often uh, the sort of approach that many of us have. But, you know, details, one way or another, they tell you a lot of things. They tell you uh, what to do with uh, the object, or, you know, if it's a building, it tells you about where it's from, maybe. But over and above all of that, uh, they convey an attitude and an approach to design. And whether consciously or unconsciously, every decision that we make when detailing a building or detailing an object, every choice that we make conveys that uh, attitude. Now, uh, obviously, when you see uh, an image like this, there are many things that you read into it which may not have been part of the original design, but however so, uh, if the way this is detailed will tell you a lot about the thought that's gone into it. Now, sometimes details can also be a little confusing or deceptive. I mean, for example, you know, the, the, this joint conveys something, it, it, seems to imply that this is a sort of solid section, then there is this thickness which is visible here. Uh, so sometimes they are not so clear. At other times, details can be very, very transparent. I mean, uh, for example, this is a very simple folding stool. It shows you that, okay, there are these two vertical members, two ties in each of the frames. And this slight notch in the vertical member allows the stool to fold absolutely flat. So, now, um, I mean, the, the sort of uh, uh, contention I have, and which you can question later on when, after, after I finish the talk, is that architectural details and, and the approach to designing details tends to be 
specific to a project and therefore often designed in such a way that you know as if this is going to happen just once so there is less concern about um, about say industrial processes or about how something will be repeated um, uh, you know say take, take a look at this image uh, as architects we love doing things like this you know it's one uh, it's it's a spiral staircase uh, it's one neat 10 mm thick ms plate with nothing on it you know which which is the tread and it's supported uh, on a central pin and on the surrounding wall with these brackets again very simple uh, um, just solid rod bent um, anchored with uh, sort of chemical anchor into the wall and just threaded ends uh, which go into the plate and then there's a bolt that holds it in place now all of this is all very well and it looks very simple but in reality it's an extremely difficult um, thing to execute you know getting every riser exactly right dealing with all the inconsistencies in the in the masonry uh, it it is one hell of a job to get, get this done but very often this is what architectural detailing is and in fact people take quite a, um, a sort of pride in how difficult <laughs> this uh, some of their details are to execute now uh, and yes this is self indulgent the reason i'm saying all of this is that this is a staircase that we have done for ourselves at our um, at the showroom uh, had a lot, lot of fun doing it but this is uh, often the case with architectural detailing uh, in the case of products and when you're detailing for products uh, there is you have to make some assumptions of how those products are going to be made what kind of industrial processes will be used uh you have to assume that there will be repetition and you uh, and you have to plan for accuracy you know even even if it's a a, a small radius at the end of a, a wooden member like this you have to make sure that that radius is precisely exactly that every single time and the other the big difference and which i think is extremely important is that that repetition allows the design to mature and improve over years and years and years that is one thing that you know that's that's one advantage that we as architects when detailing for buildings don't get you know each time is the first time and therefore it is somewhat raw <laughs> whereas a product gets better and better and better over the years uh, as we produce it now one example i love to give is the example of this company called witsu and maybe many of you may have heard of it or you may not have heard of it uh, witsu is a company now based in the uk which for years since 1959 has been producing precisely three products three let's call it three lines of products uh three lines of furniture uh which were originally designed in 1959 by Dieter Rams Dieter Rams is a product designer all of you must have heard of him you must have seen his films um he worked for many many years with the company uh, Brown which makes um, appliances a german company but this was the only line of furniture that he designed and witsu has been making exactly these products for 60 years now uh they uh, i mean you can visit their website and uh, see read all about their their philosophy and their attitude but making exactly the same products does not mean that the products don't improve uh new technology comes in there's uh, improvement in the process 
uh, of making and the product continues to get better and better and really it's the detailing that gets better and better so um, here is a view of they recently built the they shifted their um, sort of head headquarters which is office studio factory call it what you like uh, they recently shifted it to a place uh, outside london they designed the premises themselves and the way they have designed this structure also conveys the same approach and attitude it is designed like a product and in fact uh, when talking to the uh, the person who heads the company mark adams uh, this is his ambition that he will even sell these components uh, these building components as a system uh, which anybody can order and uh, you know you can add and subtract and use these components in any way you like to uh, create a space so here's an image of uh, these glue lamps which they were they were adding a kind of mezzanine floor in one of the bays and uh, so it's a building designed like a product now Uh, as i said at the beginning tdw deals with products and what we will look at now are several details that we've been using uh, you know developed over the years um, they are not good details or bad details or the best details or you know the best solutions to a certain problem nothing of the sort in fact it's quite a random selection uh, honestly based on <laughs> whatever photographs i had and um, so we'll uh, i'll explain uh, what um, how they came about and then later on of course you can uh, you know i'm hoping that your questions will make the discussion much more uh, interesting rather than just uh, running through uh, this presentation uh, they've broadly been grouped into like six or seven groups um in uh, in this this manner so the first first lot of details is details where the furniture meets the floor first example uh, you know this is the classic sort of very simple table that everybody loves to make uh, <laughs> it's a cube uh, we make it in two sizes it's uh, it, it is made to have interchangeable tops uh, you know there's there's a choice of uh, table top that we offer to uh, customers and so forth so now the the problem that we were so, uh, trying to solve is that usually this kind of a corner where three members come together is messy uh, with a you know ugly welds and that's what we wanted to resolve in the process of course you get a lot of other advantages so you know i i always feel that the best details are the ones where with one gesture you are solving several problems at one go so effectively what we've done is that instead of three members coming together at a point you shift one member slightly off so at the top this is this is the condition at the bottom this is the condition and each member is tenant so th this is a solid 10 mm by 10 mm solid bar the end is um, uh, you know turned into a round tenon and simple hole and tenon and we effectively it is held together by adhesive not a weld uh, in the process what we also got you know so of course the 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 one advantage you get is that usually if you have a rigid frame and four members touching the floor invariably the furniture will rattle because uh, floors are uneven they are they are never absolutely flat so one advantage you get of course is, is this is lifted off the floor and therefore no rattle you also get these two members which are below the table top they move in away from because you know the same logic that was applied to the 
joints at the bottom is applied at the top and the two members move away from the edge. So where you're fixing the tabletop to the frame, uh, you get more distance from the edge, which is great. It makes uh, that fixing so much stronger. And, um, you know, you don't have to deal with any small brackets and chaplas and this and that. So it's a, a very clean frame. It gives us the flexibility of uh, changeable tops and a neat and clean finish. Um, next example. This again, you know, why this slight bend? We, we uh, having an inclined frame is obvious that yes, it gets you get, get a wider base, therefore better stability. People tend to rock their chairs back and forth. So this slight bend does several things at the same time. It um, you know where where the leg meets the floor, it comes down at right angles, which is definitely better than something uh, at an angle. So less stress is on the, the leg and the frame. Uh, it allows you to use standard caps for the, the end of the leg. So if, if it's just a simple uh, chair like this, uh, standard caps, if it's a chair with casters, it allows us to do that. Uh, so which means it makes our uh, production simpler in terms of having the same standard frame that uh, is used for many different variants of the same chair. So we have the same chair with arms, without arms, with seat, uh, you know, cushion seat or something else and so on. So it allows us all that flexibility in terms of design and what we, uh, uh, you know, the end product that we offer. And it gives us added stability and standard uh, ends. Another example, this, uh, because it's specifically an out uh, furniture for outdoor use, uh, having these just a very simple welded flange at the end, uh, it, it gives you a condition where the furniture doesn't sink into soft soil. It's a quick and easy way to cap the end of the pipe and um, you know so simple detail for an outdoor table another example of outdoor furniture where you get a you know essentially you want a wide base uh, so that the chair doesn't tilt but it's also the kind of base which doesn't sink into a lawn or a, a soft surface and additionally, because sometimes you might design something for an intended use, but people will use it uh, all, anywhere. So for uh, hard surfaces, additionally, we've added these leather sleeves, which when you drag the chair, it doesn't make a noise and uh, so on. And of course, it, it's a stackable chair, so it also protects uh, pipes when you stack them one on top of the other. I hope this is, I mean, it is straight talk, but I hope it's not too straight because I can see, see that people are getting fidgety. But we'll, we'll run through the presentation quickly and then you can just uh, ask me whatever questions you like. Um, Okay, uh, I think um, last example of these where the furniture meets the floor is, you know, the very simple obvious thing that we do uh, with a lot of wooden furniture is that you give it a slight camber at the bottom. So again, it doesn't rattle. Uh, in this case, because these are stackable chairs, uh, you take it a little bit off center. This, this is centered, but um, you know, off-center so that when you stack it, the whole stack doesn't uh, start collapsing uh, in front. And, okay. Okay, so and, uh, different group of examples. I mean, that was everything to do with where things meet the floor. 
different group of examples which uh, the classic problem with all solid wood furniture is that no matter what you do uh, no matter how well seasoned the wood is people believe that by drying wood or making you know using kiln dried wood or seasoning wood it will stop moving that is not the case so unless you after drying the wood if it is completely sealed on all surfaces that is the only way it won't move otherwise uh, you know with different environments diff changes in weather wood is bound to expand and contract so usually i mean the the where two pieces of wood meet at right angles there is bound to be some shrinkage and therefore one way to deal with it is emphasize you know make a, make a sort of pronounced uh, difference in in the two surfaces instead of having them absolutely flush so uh, these slight offsets are intentional uh, it wood will always shrink across the grain so you set it off in this direction and what the additional advantage it gives us in this case is that it also prevents you know since again these are stacking chairs it leaves a slight gap so every time you stack the chairs they they don't rub together and uh, damage these members um the classic problem with table tops um the you know best way to deal with them instead of trying to fix them and uh, resist movement the best way is to allow movement so you have slotted holes in the direction in which the uh, wood is likely to expand or contract which will be always across the grain not along the length so along the length you'll see that there are just simple simple holes tight fixed and in this direction it's allowed to move Uh, another kind of example now again with and this applies to buildings also i mean in buildings too in many many cases you will have uh, you will want to create details where um, expansion contraction is just something that is expected and allowed for and therefore even in the uh, the sort of <laughs> it should be possible you know you accept that yes there will be an you will start off with an equal gap and you will end up maybe with an unequal gap but that is something that is uh, uh, acceptable and to be expected so uh, deliberately there is uh, you know what we've done is taken the table leg uh, as you can see over here the table leg goes all the way to the top uh, this this is not i mean it's an aesthetic choice it's a structural choice because it makes these tenons that much stronger otherwise you would end up with tenons coming too close to the surface uh, it allows uh, shrinkage of the wood so this one one joint does many things simultaneously uh also this slight projection on all sides again uh, instead of making it flush with the um the frame uh it allows you that um, movement and shrinkage right from the beginning you make that offset so that the offset may increase or decrease but it's never going to be entirely flush though sometimes our uh, you know our um, sort of uh, uh aesthetic language wants uh, we want to be able to make everything absolutely clean and flush but this uh, offers a better option uh, now in some cases we choose to uh, express the joinery not always it's not as if every single joint has to be shown on the surface but uh, in some cases that's a deliberate choice we make uh, say for example a, a joint like this or in a case like this where um, 
uh, again, this does two things. It's not just a matter of expression, but these through tenons make the joint that much stronger instead of uh, stopping the tenon short inside this um, uh, vertical member. This having the larger, uh, larger diameter recess is, it's more just an aesthetic choice um, because it expresses the, the full diameter of the uh, cross tie. And then this, this is the actual tenon coming through. This again is just a pin and a box joint. Uh, this again, simple, simple detail where we plug the, you know, use a solid wood plug to uh, cover the ends of uh, the head of the screw. So you recess the screw head and plug it with a solid wood plug. Then finding the appropriate hardware. <clears throat> Either you you're able to locate the appropriate hardware and use it, or in many cases, we make the hardware, custom make it. Um, so in this case, it's a combination of a wooden frame and a steel frame, where the two come together, there's a, uh, you know, the wooden member, um, meaning there is a threaded steel pin and a cup washer and an allen bolt that goes into that uh, threaded portion. The cup washer is important because then you get a really clean uh, recess over there. And of course, and the wood doesn't get damaged or pressed, you know, if you tighten the bolt too much, then that is likely to happen. Um, similarly, um, sort of custom made hinges or pivots. In this case, the, the problem to be solved was that we wanted the uh, shutters of a cabinet to open absolutely flat, uh, 180 degrees. And therefore, and of course we didn't want those very large uh, you know, hinges visible uh, on the vertical. And therefore this is the, the sort of hinge, it lifts the shutter out and allows it to open flat against the next cabinet because these are cabinets that can be stacked and grouped and combined in various ways. Then detailing furniture for flexibility and variable components. You've al already seen some of that with the, with the uh, chair with studio uh, uh, in the early examples but here is one example of a uh, of a stackable stool i mean you have several but uh, those are not all made by us <laughs> so that, i just want to clarify that all the similar looking stools at sept are not not made by tdw but so effectively there are two three details in this one one is this this joint at the center, which, uh, you know, it's a Y um, made of solid rod and then uh, which goes into the tubular steel sections and therefore you get this very clean, um, uh, very clean welded joint at this point. Otherwise, again, you would have the same problem of three members coming together. Uh, additionally, what we wanted was to make these seats you know, offer a choice of seats, interchangeable, etc. Uh, production can go on in parallel. So here, what you're seeing is this is a, a four mm thick aluminum sheet, uh, which you know gives us the it gives greater stability. You don't have that usual problem of you know very thin mild steel plate, which always. Uh, bobs up and down and makes a sound when you sit on it. So this is a nice 4 mm thick sheet. Uh, it's powder coated in various colors and you can uh, mount those onto a, a standard frame. So the frames and uh, seats are produced separately and simultaneously. Um, 
So this is what the stackable stool is. And these are just other variants of the, the same, uh, same basic design. Uh, another similar product, these are nested tables where again, uh, the question was of how, how we connect the top to the frame, uh, options of different frames which can be combined with different tops. And in this case, a very simple um, sort of wooden cleat, which um, it does two things in the in the instances where we offer solid wood tops it also allows a little bit of movement of the top and in other cases where uh, i mean what you see here is a laminated top so you can have various colors of laminates combined with uh, different colors of frames and so on so uh, very simple neat detail which does uh, multiple uh, things Sorry. Okay. We also make uh, precast concrete furniture. Now in this case, the problem to be solved was that it's uh, uh, the, the precast unit is, is a part of a bench. So you, you can, you have the option of combining several such units to form a bench that is single sided, double sided, uh, the reason for having uh, such small units was that they are manually uh, movable. So you, uh, it's easy and you don't need a crane or a forklift to handle these units. They can be lifted off a truck, put in place and connected together. Now the connection happens with uh, a stainless steel pipe that acts as a tie. So two, two such pipes, you can see the, uh, the end of these here. And the real problem to be solved was that, uh, you know, how do we make this end tamper proof so that people don't just open up the uh, nut at the end of the pipe and then uh, take these away? Because that's usually the problem that you encounter when you're, uh, you know, when the municipal corporation or some public, it's to be used in a public place. So, uh, after various trying various alternatives, what we developed was uh, a, basically this is the nut. Instead of using a traditional nut, because people, uh, you know, with a traditional nut, even if it's a, a dome nut or a hexagonal nut or whatever, uh, people would have the tools to open it. Here, hopefully, you would have to have a special spanner to be able to open such a nut. So it's a a simple solution, but designed uh, in such a way that uh, hopefully people can't tamper with it. So this is a threaded nut with just two uh, holes, and this is the spanner uh, to be used to open it. And this is how it would look. This is the end, uh, threaded end of the pipe, uh, the the nut that with internal threads that goes into it, and that's the spanner. Um, okay. Uh, often, um, several of our um, sort of furniture designs are part of a larger system. And uh, so, for example, this table, it's a very simple multi-purpose table, which you might use as a dining table, study table, any kind of table anywhere. But um, what is probably the most important component of it is not all the different add-ons that we, you know, you can have a panel, no panel, uh, that modesty panel in front, on the side, uh, you can add a, a pedestal unit, all kinds of things. But this is the most important uh, component because um, not only does it connect the top with the understructure, with the legs, but it also is, it actually stabilizes the frame because it, um, you know, it, uh, and uh, the position changes. Um, 
depending on how it is used so it has it might sometimes be placed diagonally like this it might be placed parallel to the frame it has in some cases it has pins which hold a panel together in other cases not and therefore therefore this peculiar shape of you know a rectangle with corners cut off and um, the fixing is usually in at least two members simultaneously it doesn't just uh, hold in one member and um, so again the, this notion that it solves several problems at at one go and so these are just images of uh, you know all the different kind of avatars that this table takes sometimes uh, these are just playful details for example some you know just a simple cut out like this which would allow you to uh, hang the chair on a peg if you want to just hang it on the wall and get uh, get it out of the way it helps you pick up the chair and so on and so forth uh, this is a small you know, small accessories which are made out of uh, literally just waste you know uh, these, these were uh, Uh, cut off ends of certain of a certain size uh, which we recycled to make these small stackable trays and the the playful bit is that the the joint varies depending on uh, what size of cut off has been used so the joint comes in various places and that joint is marked with a circular recess like this which then allows you to use it to hold a cup or something like that so it's just just a fun uh, playful thing but uh, it is you know instead of just um, treating it very lightly it's taken seriously and uh, you know it it adds a feature to a product that could be very uh, boring and simple uh, similarly this uh, picture frame which um, you know it, it it just uses a small wedge to actually hold the uh, the glass within the frame and also acts as a stand uh, to to hold it at an incline uh, now coming to maybe something closer to architecture which is these um, you've seen these shading systems there there's one version at the sept library and um here it's something that um it is a product but it is a product that invariably has to be changed and has to be customized for every single project that we you know where it is installed it's very rarely that the project conforms to all the standard assumptions that we had made when the when the system was developed so it is a system that was developed a product that was developed in uh, 2009 uh, the designer is dinesh sharma some of you may know him uh, and it was uh, you know this this was the first project where it was used so many of the assumptions made were based on uh, what was required for this project so um it was assumed that there would be you know uh, it would be mounted on a projection that's 600 mm deep uh, rcc sill and uh, ledge at the top and uh, so on and so forth since 2009 we've uh, customized it for many different projects so different um, uh, different uh, th this is the same project this is safal profit air which was the first uh, project in 2009 but after that we uh, used it in many places the mounting uh, detail might have changed slightly uh, various small things may have changed in uh, in one instance we uh, had to change how the handle and stopper were attached to the uh, vertical uh, columns but those were relatively minor changes the example i want to describe here is our our most recent um, um recent project this building also you may have seen it's right next to sept university and it's the school of arts and sciences at amdavad university 
Now, what was the big challenge here was that uh, this building has a lot of um, sort of varied openings, big and small. And um, for the first time, uh, we were actually uh, making these for a height of 5.5 meters. Thus far, it had been, you know, sort of three meters was the default, stretching it to four meters at the most, but now this time round, it was 5.5 meters. So it was quite a challenge. And uh, challenge not just structurally, but, um, you know, when you, when you think of, when you take a well-designed product like this, ideally, you don't want to change anything. Your, your first response is that we want to hold on to most of the details for various reasons, because they've been tried and tested. Uh, you know, we've, we've uh, used, uh, I mean, tested not just uh, in the manner of uh, in a lab, but also in all, all weather conditions. They've been tried on uh, in various site situations and so on and so forth. So this uh, project had also the challenges of, you know, unusual conditions like this. You, you can see this kind of a beam that drops down. The sill condition was, uh, you know, usually the projection is on the same level, but in this case, it used to drop down like this. Uh, we also had to worry about the fact that uh, even visually, when you're moving through the building, you don't want something drastically different uh, outside one. What you really see are the, is this, this inner, inner structure is what you see up close. On the outside of the building, you see the plain uh, panels as uh, on the facade. So we also had to make sure that when you move from one space to the other, you don't see something completely different. I mean, uh, say in one space you have uh, pipes that are uh, say 46 mm in diameter and then suddenly you have a 100 mm diameter pipe. It's just, it would be uh, too disturbing. So keeping all those uh, challenges in mind and of course, uh, you know, consulting with a structural consultant all along. Uh, the kind of solution we came up with, uh, you know, through drawings, model, initially through drawings, models, and so on, was uh, that we would try a double pipe system like this. So effectively what we are doing is a, using a truss, uh, creating a truss. Um, this is, uh, a rendered image of how, uh, you know, at the, at the top end and the bottom end, we would still hold on to the, you know, our standard fixing details because um, it might, uh, you know, wh what you might be thinking is what's so difficult about changing a few pins here and there and a few, <laughs> but, you know, if one has invested in, in jigs, in fixtures, in, in so many things. So every little, even if you change um, one recess or one threaded insert or one hole in a pipe, it has uh, huge repercussions. So we wanted to try out a solution like this, which of course, first reference was the structural engineer and he, uh, you know, sort of modeled it and came up with uh, that, oh, you know, it will deflect by so much and this is what happened and so on and so forth. Uh, the reason I'm going through this process is also to, you know, in the first half of the talk where we were dealing with furniture, uh, you saw the details themselves. Here, what I'm trying to do is illustrate the process that very often it's a sort of back and forth process. Uh, it's, it's not as if there's a straight line thinking that, okay, uh, here's the concept and then this is how I'll uh, detail it. Uh, you have to keep going back and forth and trying out different things. So after getting the structural engineers in inputs, we also thought that we would actually test it out in our workshop. 
because effectively you know these the vertical column behaves like a simply supported beam it is it is merely pinned at the two ends the way our system works it's actually hung from the top and merely held in place uh, at the bottom so it's like a simply supported beam the wind load is like a you know it's like a uniformly distributed load all along the length of the beam and we wanted to see okay in reality how much will it deflect because there are many things that weren't in the structural model that you know uh, even the panels would add a certain amount of stiffness the 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 length of these connecting pins between the two pipes would make a difference so initially we started off with 10 mm length increased to 20 mm length even that makes a difference to how much the pipes will deflect eventually so here are some images of um, you know how we set up this experiment at the workshop um, this is our uniformly distributed load we had bags of uh, you know filled with sand 25 kgs each um, placed at precisely equal intervals we started loading from the two ends and moved towards the center and oh, and uh, you know it the reason for doing this kind of experiment was that though you might have all uh, the theoretical data and the modeling it gives you the reassurance that before you put it out in the field you have some uh, you know actual um, you you have worked uh, with the product and you have actual information of how about how it will behave um here's a, we also installed a full size mock up at the workshop uh, mocked up the the sill situation also which you saw, saw in that earlier uh, 3d model and uh, you know this is another image of the mock up we and added another usually the the entire system where uh, the groups the the louvers are grouped together uh, and and there's a sort of tie at the top which allows you to operate the entire group with one handle we added a second tie below not as a not uh, to reduce the deflection or as a stiffener but as a safety feature because that again is a is a very important thing when you're dealing with um, with structure with products that are actually architectural products and at this scale so you you want to be 100% sure about safety uh, and yeah another image of that handle and the the lock plate um, a feature that we added to the fixing of the handle was that uh, you know adding this color makes it reversible because uh, depending on uh, north south east west orientation we usually we determine which direction the louvers will open in but in one case uh, on a different project we had a situation where the client was not so worried about shading but they they wanted the view that was available outside uh, their building and we had to sort of reverse the the direction of opening of the louvers entirely um, so this this was an added feature that we introduced later and um, yeah so here's the the finished uh, project you can you can in here where the louvers are open you can see that um, you know the lower beam and sill and these are the 5.5 meter ones these are smaller you know 3 meters i think these are the smallest height and so from when you move inside the building maybe you can go and visit the building and you'll see that in spite of all these variations you don't really get a sense of it uh, when you are in there so that really was the big challenge that how do you change and uh, you know change details uh in 
kind of modify the product for specific uh, for a specific situation while keeping the overall uh, feeling and aesthetics the same um, so yeah that's the end of my presentation i think a little shorter than uh, what uh, <laughs> you you had hoped for but uh, i hope there'll be questions and maybe uh, that will bring out some things that i may have missed in uh, in presenting this so questions from anybody so maybe ismat you can stop sharing so that you you are able to see the audience sure yeah that will be good and may i request everyone that whoever has question to either put it on the chat box or you can ask directly so ayushi you are going to coordinate that yes sir i'll coordinate okay so please uh, you can start question arun are you the first one yes uh, i have a question so uh, ma'am you mentioned uh, dieter rams as one of your uh, sort of and you mentioned him during the course of the the uh, presentation as well so who are the other industrial designers or furniture um, uh, designers who got you interested in or wanting to you know pursue furniture as a um as a career uh hmm <laughs> uh, well i uh, let me clarify i mentioned dieter rams uh not i mean certainly his uh, his work is uh, very uh, inspiring i mentioned it as an example of what um uh, you know detailing for products is all about so not not just as an inspiring figure and therefore i mean when you ask me okay who i mean there's there's a huge list of names i don't know where to begin i mean maybe i should begin closest to home and uh, that inspiration was actually after i i i started uh, working on furniture which was uh, mr upadhyay gajanan upadhyay of uh, you've seen a lot of uh, in the furniture that i showed you so um uh, some of his uh, designs many of his designs so he's certainly an inspiration then uh, i'd say um, i mean so many <laughs> hans wegner uh, so many furniture designers i don't know the the names don't immediately come to mind but uh, the list is endless and so i i mean it's it's hard to say that i was inspired by one or two and therefore i started uh, that's not how it happened i just kind of wandered into it <laughs> and uh, and i mean i think what is uh, most enjoyable is that once you've been trained as an architect uh, i mean designing it, it it's it's an approach that you learn a skill that you learn and then you apply that to any kind of uh, you know whatever you are designing you can have the same same fun and same excitement in uh, designing that small uh, threaded nut as you can have uh, in designing a building ma'am there was one more question from kurian um, yeah, yeah you can go ahead yeah yeah uh, ma'am i wanted to uh, ask like in terms of the furniture design um, uh, how do you look at the factor uh, you know of wastage when you kind of start designing and detailing um yeah uh, so that that was the basic uh, you know we we touched upon certain factors like flexibility uh, movement of materials uh, you know behavior of materials and how when you kind of bring two different materials together What, what what would you think so in that sense um, how do you kind of look at um, it's actually a, a very important factor and definitely an important factor when you're dealing with sheet materials uh, you know sheet materials or things that um, uh, when you're dealing with material that comes in standard sizes so your starting point would certainly be uh, you know you you factor that in i didn't 
show that example, but for example, uh, shelving systems that we design, there's uh, storage, storage racks, shelving systems. So there our starting point would definitely be the eight by four panels. And uh, if we are developing modules, they would be in, uh, you know, modules would be based on that sheet size. Um, so that's one part of the answer to your question. The other, of course, uh, that waste, uh, say for example, uh, like those uh, offcuts that I showed, that kind of waste uh, is a lot of fun to work with and turn into other products. So uh, that's also a part of what we do. Hi, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Sure, here. Uh, yes. So, uh, in what I liked the most in your in what in your lecture was that a, de a detail of that product in furniture cases is solving two or more problems. Or yes. Yes. And the more it solves, the better the detail. It was very, very interesting. And and my question to you is that uh, in some of your furnitures, adding and subtracting of, of certain details or parts is leading to different functionalities. For example, the same furniture can be used in an outdoor or in, an, in a soft uh, surface or a hard surface. A uh, similar product which I was very interested in is was the Bene Pixel furniture, like so in which they have list boxes uh, they stack it together to make it a, a furniture, a, a table, or a bench. So my question to you is: key, when you are detail, when you are detailing of such furnitures, of thinking of not of one functionality but multiple functionalities, uh, what is your thought process uh, on to about going to, about this process now? Um, okay, one uh, one word of caution that. Uh, when I say that uh, you know a detail that solves several problems is a, a, a very good detail, what I'm referring to is an economy of means. You know, so it I'm not really trying to say that um, I'm not referring to something where uh, okay, a table becomes a bed and then the bed becomes a uh, cupboard or uh, I mean that is not what I'm advocating because those are uh, I mean those you really have to deal with cautiously uh, because uh, the the you are creating the design brief yourself and that can very easily an unduly complicated design brief can end up with an a uh, sort of clumsy solution to be honest so I'm not a big big fan of that kind of multifunctionality. Um, it's, it's often the simplest, absolutely simplest products that are the most multifunctional. Like for example, that, that table that I showed you, the simple tabletop with four legs is, uh, there's a lot you can do with it. I mean, it's, it, it, it's more multifunctional than something that is made to move and fold and bend and uh, do all these complicated things. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, ma'am. The simpler, the better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, if it can be just a box, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Ratik has the next question. Um, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Ma'am, so in the presentation, there was this point when you were talking about the shrinkage of the wood when you have at the cross junction. So at that time, the, there was no movement at that particular junction, but if at all, there's a kind of a movement in, in which you have two members connecting together, then how do you maybe look into the factor of that shrinkage? Because it will be getting, having a kind of a movement as well to it. Are so, you, sorry, um, are you talking about the one with the at where they meet at right angles or are you talking? Yes, ma'am, at the right angles. At the base of the chair? At right? the base of the chair. Okay, yeah. So, so if I take it as a situation in which if I suppose to wanted to have a movement at that particular right angle junction, mm -hmm. and when we talk about the shrinkage of the wood, so that in that time, how do we like have a connection between those two members 
which allows for the movement and also caters for that uh, shrinkage of the member as well. No, no, the joint is a tight joint. It's a tenor right. office joint. Right, what ma'am. I was trying to point out is that usually, I mean, not usually, always, uh, the shrinkage will happen only across the grain. Right? So, instead of um, joining the two members flush and then having an offset, you start off by creating an offset, make it a feature of your design. And uh, in that way, when, when that offset increases slightly, you are not even going to notice it, you know, because that increase will be by uh, 2 mm at the most, 1 mm, 2 mm. But if you have both members meeting at right angles and absolutely flush on all surfaces, you will immediately notice that uh, shrinkage. So uh, that is what I was pointing out, not that the joint would open up. Right, right, ma'am. Oh, Karishma? Yeah. Ma'am, I observed a range of materials like being used in the furniture design. Like one was of steel, one was completely wood, and somewhere like combination of both steel and wood. So what are the factors that are taken into consideration for selecting materials for different range of furnitures? That's a good question because that's something all designers do. And um, I think that... Uh, those the sort of choices we make is uh, you know it's it's not only um, it's not just a question of uh, cost it's not merely uh, aesthetics it's not merely structure um, there's uh, i mean it is it does also express your attitude as a designer so the, the the materials you choose for a, a, a particular you know to to design a particular product or to solve a particular problem there is always uh, there's also a kind of um, a sort of philosophical side to it if i may say so I mean, there are all all the obvious factors that you you do worry about cost you do worry about structural stability uh, how the two materials will work together, how will you connect them, uh, you know, what uh, process will you use, what kind of machines will you use, all those are factors. But you'll still always end up with two or three options. And when you narrow it down from those two or three options, it's finally your your approach. Thank you, ma'am. Um, we have one more question. Uh, actually, he's having a low internet, so he's actually to speak. The development of idea to detail in both architecture and furniture. So, what are what is what is the difference that you consider that is important in the process? Um, I yeah, I tried to emphasize that difference right at the beginning. That. Um, the uh, what I have seen in having worked both as an architect and and then later become a furniture designer and product designer, the main difference I see and which makes um, uh, is precisely this: that when when something is designed but once and executed on site. Um, and often that happens also with, with interiors, with furniture that is designed for interiors. Uh, and I'm not saying, I, this is not a value judgment. This is not good or bad. But the fact is that you don't have the time to allow that design to mature. So it is always a little bit rough, a little bit raw. Whereas uh, designs that are meant to be uh, not just repeated in terms of batches, you know, that yes, you will make a uh, 100 or 200 of these at a time or even more, but that you will repeat that same product year after year and maybe over several years. That's when you end up with a really high quality, good product. Otherwise, you cannot. It's just not feasible with 
uh, even with the best design skill and the best manufacturing skills um ma'am i myself had a question mm -hmm. so uh, you mentioned the testing of the rod for the uh, shading device so uh, for the load testing uh, there was only a testing of a single rod so when you have this multiple uh, panels which are connected and uh, the weight would be increasing so is there a difference that comes in the detailing on how yes. do you cater to that yeah, yeah, so of course there yeah. is. and it's not as if uh, this was this was just to illustrate that uh, illustrate the whole process so first you are given a design brief uh you uh, quickly eliminate a lot of options at the drawing level drawing uh, you make 3d models you render etc uh, etc et then there's an idea you want to test so uh, there is a structural consultant of course the structural consultant works within his his framework of and they are bound to be conservative it is their job to be conservative uh, so that yields some result now you want to go a step further i mean at least we wanted to go a step further because it was possible for us to do so it might not always be possible for somebody to test something uh, in actual fact so which is why we then did this this load test that helped us reinforce uh, the thoughts that we had that okay we are not drastically off and if at all in the field it will be even safer than this that's that's what we wanted to establish and then we did a full full scale mock up here uh, and then finally it was installed at site so that was what i was trying to illustrate oh, okay it was thank you ma'am oh. it was not just uh, then this one test and then okay that's the final product uh, that wasn't how it was decided uh ma'am there's a question from gazin as well yeah uh so ma'am uh, i would basically want to ask the difference in the process or how do you approach or start detailing a furniture product and a shading device so uh, that many themes were discussed as in you said that there were different purposes for example for furniture design our uh, storage interchangeability reusability uh, became important whereas for the shading device the movement and the load transfer and its durability become becomes important with all of this in place we already have constraints of materials and um, how things would come together so all of with all of this on the plate how do you decide where to start thinking about the detail from what are the factors which come prior and what are the factors which go down well i mean isn't that the case with any design brief whatever it might be even if it's a building you'll have a client who will give you a design brief and there will be some things that you'll prioritize others uh, less so no? wouldn't that be the case with anything that you design but again coming back to this difference between products and buildings what you prioritize is different because like you pointed out in the case of products uh, you will have to worry about okay uh, you know how how will it be transported how will it be stored can i uh, store it in a dismantled condition how much time will it take to install those are things that are very important uh in in a uh, you know a different kind of uh, say in a building for instance uh, those may not be such a priority there are other factors that take that are more important we uh, we have a question from abhay uh ma'am uh, hello i am abhay i had a question regarding the leather seat chair the seat had the leather so with the tenon joints i observed the thickness of the leg where the tenon joint goes that is very thin next to the tenon joint mm -hmm. like how we can we determine like what is the section size that will be stable and something like that 
uh, are you talking about the vertical section or horizontal but the vertical one hmm, vertical is it's the same throughout it's not very thin uh, that little the slight recess was just uh, just to indicate the diameter of the cross tie but the answer to your question is that most of the time you arrive at these things through experience and some of it through trial and error uh, hopefully less error <laughs> and that's how it goes yeah uh, we are actually done so uh, is, is does anyone have a question yeah i have another question uh, ma'am also can you elaborate on uh, what expertise or how how many different people you need in a team when you are doing a furniture versus when you are doing the shading device you will need different people to perform different tasks uh, so how is it executed on site or the models that you do okay um hmm okay so um well it um, it varies in our case what we have is we have a lot of the skills in house so um, i mean all of you are welcome to visit the workshop one day but over the years we've sort of built in the the uh, the facilities and the skills to do both all of the say for the shading system we do all of the metal work in house there are very few components that we actually uh, sort of outsource get them done by elsewhere uh, so we have a fully fledged wood workshop we have a metal workshop we have uh, engineers we have uh, the the crew that goes and installs on site uh, sometimes if it's a very large project we might we might hire a team from outside but they would work under the supervision of an experienced installer um so i don't know if that is what you are asking or are you asking about skills in the studio uh yeah it was kind of mix of both things yeah so this, this you, is certainly, more... you certainly need someone with product design skills uh i mean very often architects feel that oh we are architects so we can do anything but that is not true there's a lot of reedu retraining that you need to do to move from architecture to product design so you do need somebody with that mindset and that is why uh, you know dinesh worked on these shading systems for several years before it came out as a final product so oh uh, yeah there's one more question from yashash so hello ma'am Uh, i had this question that there is an al there's always an urge or uh, in to do or something new or explore something new but uh, when you are talking about uh, something about modularity and standard standardization for some projects with the use of flexibility and for different projects so are there any are there what are the real challenges in order to convince the clients for for executing that thing which has been done before not in same manner but with us with a little bit of tweaking and uh, flexibility in that so there is a process of standardization but what are the challenges for convincing the client is what i wanted to ask yeah yeah you're absolutely right and uh, particularly with something like the shading systems there's always this uh, um you know people uh, people want something different they want something new that's that's always a challenge and uh unfortunately that new and different can end up really um sort of um, messing up the product so uh, it's a skill that you have to develop you have to f- first of all you have to be convinced yourself i think half half the problem lies there that designers themselves have to be convinced that by repeating the same thing again and again i'm making it better this urge to make things new and different uh, lands us in a mess 
so that's the first step and if you are sufficiently convinced you will be able to convince your client that it's in their interest to and and of course in your design you build in a certain amount of vari uh, you know variability so for example the panel material there is a choice that we offer that there's a or b or c and the you know maybe three or four panel materials that you can use but maybe fifth is not possible at the moment because it hasn't been tried or have, have we haven't had uh, haven't tested it enough or whatever the reason might be so it is in the client's interest to do this mam yash had a few the questions the problem is really with the designers not the client <laughs> <laughs> they, they need to be sure of what they're doing yeah so i had a long question so what role does articulation of louvers play in defining the language of the building and language that you explore as a practice in different different kind of projects uh, because integrating the factors of solar radiation and solar shading through louvers in the same design it always seems to dominate uh, in terms of final building form most of the time we end up making boxed up or boxy buildings uh, uh, also the practice uh, practicing this kind of projects Uh, uh, end up making similar buildings when they try to engage louvers as a shading device in many of their works. So, how exploratory does the inclusion of louvers play a role in defining exploratory forms in a building? Yeah. So, um, I understand what you're saying, and in fact, what has happened, you know, our our intention and our reason for developing uh, the shading systems was. uh purely this that yes it's good for the environment it helps you to reduce cooling costs in your building and uh, therefore this is something worth promoting uh over the years what has happened and particularly with speculative uh, you know developer built buildings what they are seen more as a facade treatment uh most often the client is not so interested in uh, energy saving or uh, how much uh, heat gain reduction and so on but they they just see it as as a, a sort of aesthetic treatment on the outside and that's what um, uh, that's what they are looking for and um, it's difficult to kind of balance those two impulses make sure that uh, uh they they get the the advantages that they are looking for and at the same time you ensure that it also does some good uh, in terms of uh, reducing heat gain you have to juggle the two things yeah ma'am uh, do we have any one more for the questions Yeah, Karishma yeah. can take over. Okay, Sudesh. Yeah, Sudesh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, as, as you discussed, ma'am, that uh, uh, in the process of manufacturing, uh, if there is a slight change, how how does it affect the overall process, and what margin could be kept uh, if 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 it's a large process of manufacturing? Hmm. When you say how does it affect? Uh, the oh. obvious, yeah obvious effect is uh, in terms of cost right uh, material time everything so i maybe i haven't understood your question okay uh, uh, basically if it is a, it's a large uh, like very large process and if there is a certain part which is completely changed so how does it affect the overall uh, like Overall process, like in the lower system where where you had a single bar and it has to be doubled, then how did it or like? Uh, okay, so say um, uh, maybe uh, just as an example that uh, where you're saying that okay, instead of a single pipe, we used double pipe. Uh, now. Uh, So why did we do that you know the obvious solution would have been to increase the diameter of the pipe increase the wall thickness of the pipe 
uh, all of those would have worked. But what this does is that, uh, yes, you are increasing the material, but first of all, uh, all of the material remains uniform. So in procuring it, that is an advantage that you're procuring all pipes of the same size. You are getting the, uh, the advantage of a large diameter pipe without that, uh, you know, without it becoming visually clumsy. Uh, you uh, also uh, say the connectors, you know, the pins and the spacers that we use, there again we would repeat the ones, uh, I mean, repeat uh, sizes and diameters that we are already using, say for example, for the for connecting the handle to, to the column, the spacers that are used, similar sort of spacers would be used for connecting these two pipes together. So that is how you would uh, kind of optimize the changes. Uh, we have one more question from Anish. Good evening, ma'am. This is Anish. So in today's world where a lot of technology is being involved, we are being coming with intelligent facade systems where artificial intelligence is being and more of the kinetics facades are being introduced. So would you see that involving more and more technology is a drawback or an advantage Not for sure. I mean, device systems while in terms of maintenance or the cost of manufacturing? So how would we think of it? So having newer technologies is always is always good. Um, if you are if you mean specifically for these shading systems, uh, yes, I mean. We are looking at motorizing, but uh, sure, I mean, if, if there is a project that can absorb uh, the costs of in, uh, sort of integrating all that technology, well, I'm sure, why not? Right now, the, the, the kind of um, budgets that we have to deal with, uh, it's not viable. Yeah, thank you. And finally, it all boils down to the square foot cost of construction and how much are people willing to pay to, because this comes in at the tail end. They don't, don't see it as a benefit right from the beginning. It's just a, a facade treatment as far as they are concerned. Okay. So no one is willing to invest that much. No. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Would you like I think that I'll I think that uh, I'll speak a little bit before maybe some of you from the students can can thank her on behalf. Uh, you know, thank you, Ismat, for first accepting. Uh, and I felt that it was a wonderful presentation. A uh, lot of things that we learned in a very simple way, because because that that is something which is very difficult that somebody has tried to unravel. Uh, a very small, subtle details which comes out with the logic of construction and, and therefore the whole uh, geometry, whether it was furniture or whether it was the shading device, we were seeing smaller and we were discussing something in MM. So almost like little bit of things which were coming out. Why do you, for example, uh, stagger something when you are making, when you have got something which is connecting to the ground or, or how, do you, how, do you, how do you modify when you are seeing something at the top? Or for example, if we are talking about the shading device, how does something become repetitive and no point in trying to invent, reinvent a detail which already existed and therefore the base from where it connected remains the same and there's a connector that sort of goes. So what we were seeing within, within a short duration, a lot of, lot of very clearer idea, but, but sort of worked out step by step in a way that one we could see a continuity of a thought. Uh, for me, for example, even a small detail like, like using of a, let's say a cup washer, when you were trying to talk about the, the, the chair, or for example, when you were trying to work out the horizontal, uh, horizontal spanning member and then trying to relate it to diameter, obviously talks about the way uh, there are certain ideas which continues from one to the other to the third. Similarly, the idea of stackability, 
the idea of trying to when it is connecting to the base trying to arc it or 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 trying to just little bit uh, make a curve so that it is stackable but also it does not uh, transfer the stress right at the bottom but slowly it sort of is able to transfer it onto the leg are are very small gestures but it sort of talks about that in order to arrive at a solution uh, which seems to be very obvious it's not so obvious in the in the in the way one when one starts looking at it and therefore economy of means what we were trying to talk about it uh, gets reflected everywhere and, and 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 that was something which was coming out all throughout that when you were talking about one gesture is able to resolve uh, resolve a lot i obviously it didn't mean that you know you are trying to make a multiple stackable sort of stuff what it clearly meant that a subtle thing a very intelligent gesture can create a lot can solve a lot of uh, issues so 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 i felt that uh, for for us i think there is lot to lot to take from this presentation now apart from uh, this remarkable uh, you know furniture design finishes and and all those kinds of things which we keep on seeing about the work which tdw does this has opened up from an academic point of view uh, uh, a sort of a, a way which 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 can help us to look at detail now in a much more careful manner where we are not saying that we are we are all the time you know waiting for the sake of it but subtle innovations happens because because it has got lot more meaning in in the way it sort of fits in it sort of gets standardized repeated etc etc so so on behalf of the whole uh, you know the the course and 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 on behalf of some of the students uh who are from the theory and 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 sort of practice of detail but but you had an audience of more than 100 in this uh in this sort of uh, live uh, presentation i i i really thank you that you accepted this and and it was really wonderful to learn from you thank you very much and i i hope it wasn't too off off course and <laughs> and that uh, it'll get more people thinking about products and how to design products thank you very much uh yeah karishma would like to yeah thank on our behalf on behalf of sept university department of architecture i would like to thank ismit ma'am for uh, enlightening us on details of furniture and shading devices we understood the importance of cross disciplinary approach when we had tried to attempt shading device in our foundation studio and the talk shows the importance of detailing Uh, detailing to uh, articulate a space in a better way it was an enlightening experience and the knowledge we have gained will be highly valuable in our future work and practices i would we would also like to thank sankalpa for organizing the state talk and thank you everyone for your active participation thank you ma'am thank you very much okay yeah we can all sign off now thank you all yeah. thank you so much